Hello, Pastor Sam here and welcome to Facebook Live. I'm so glad you joined us today. As you watch this telecast, just whisper a prayer that God will use it to touch the lives of millions of people around the world. Also, I would like for you to know how much I appreciate your support. Many of you that watch every week send us a love offering, a gift of some kind to help us. I really appreciate it. While I'm not soliciting your support, I wanted you to know how much I do appreciate what you give. Thank you so much. It's my sincere prayer that you'll be blessed by this program and that your life will be enriched. May you experience the power and presence of Jesus Christ. Just before we go into this service live, allow me to pray a prayer with you right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for all my friends who are watching over Facebook. Wherever they are, bless them, surround them with your love, May the Holy Spirit envelop them today and may something that's said in this message or something that they see in the next hour or so as we come together around your word would enrich their lives and bless them, challenge and inspire them. And may all of us choose to bring our lives into perfect alignment with your word, which is your will. God bless you now as we go together into that service. It's live and it's already in progress. night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had broken it, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The word that he used there literally was rent or torn. And I can see in my mind the image of Jesus violently tearing the bread. A few hours later, there was an earthquake as Jesus hung on that cross. 
And the veil of the temple was rent or torn from the top to the bottom with the finger of God, giving us access into the Holy of Holies. Jesus said, I am the way to the Father. He took the cup when he'd supped, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As oft as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. Matthew 25, Jesus gives us the parable of the ten virgins. And he says that they went in preparing for a wedding. A bride had accepted the proposal of the bridegroom. Do you know how she, ex she accepted that proposal? In Jesus' day, a Jewish man that wanted to marry a woman would have her seated and would present to her a cup of wine. If she would drink the wine, it meant that she had accepted the proposal for marriage and they became engaged. If she refused to drink, it meant that she had rejected his proposal. When Jesus passed the cup to all of his disciples and he said to them, every one of you drink from this cup. If you don't drink from the cup, you'll have no place in the kingdom. It's not an option today to say, well, I'm not in the mood. I'm not inclined. I'm not at the top of my spiritual game, so to speak. So today I'll just pass. The purpose of communion has always been about soul searching a time of introspection, a time when we ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to shine His light into the deepest crevices of our soul to reveal anything in us that might displease Him. And so I invite you to drink the cup, but first you must accept the proposal. Do you want to be in the bride of Christ or not? If you do, then drink the cup and all of you drink from it. Somebody said, you know, I've been sick for a long time and I don't know why I can't get healed. When Paul was talking about the communion, the revelation they received from the Lord, he said, there's a reason why many of you are sick and some sleep, which means they died prematurely because they didn't claim their healing. And he said, it's because you don't understand communion. You don't understand covenant. When you understand the basic truth about this covenant of love and faith that we have with God the Father through Jesus Christ, you can claim your healing and every other blessing that has been provided for us at Calvary and held in reserve in the heavenlies for those who will reach up to claim them. If today you're sick in your body, if today you're struggling with some issue, if today there are problems that press you to the ground, it's time for you to understand who you are. We sang a chorus earlier, he's a good, good father. That's who he is and I'm loved by him, that's who I am. But God is a covenant God. He made covenant with a man by the name of Abram and changed his name to Abraham because he had to rise to the occasion. Your life is going to be changed forever for the better. And I want to incorporate my name in your name. And the principal sound of the names of God in the Old Testament is a breathy sound. And so God said, when they speak your name, they'll no longer say Abram, but they will say Abraham. 
I believe that today God is taking us to a higher place spiritually if we understand the covenant. When God struck covenant with Abram, he knew that he was fallible and he knew that he and his descendants would fail to live up to the terms of the covenant. That's why in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which became known as the blessing of Abraham, the great majority of that chapter deals with the curse when we're disobedient. But this time in the new covenant, God said, I'm not making this covenant with a man. I'm making it with my son. I'm making it with the Messiah. I'm making it with the chosen one. Over and over and over again, about 250 times, as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, you find the expression in him or in Christ. God did not strike covenant with just a man, but with his son. And as we abide in him, we are blessed and not cursed. We are blessed when we go out. And when we come back in and the city in our feet in the field and our basket and our store are blessed. But we must abide in him. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and pray with me just for a moment. Ask the Lord to reveal if there's anything in your life that would displease him before you take this cup. And then it's up to you to ask God to forgive you and to confess that sin before the Lord. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father God, as we come to this sacred time, we realize that you've given to us this covenant sign for a reason. It requires self-examination. It requires that we look deep into ourselves. And I pray today that if there's anything in me that displeases you, please forgive me for I plead the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ over my life. And I pray that what the blood has cleansed, the Holy Spirit would energize and anoint and empower. Lord, as we observe Holy Communion, we are asking now that every person in the body who is sick or afflicted would be healed of any malady or affliction or infirmity. And we ask, oh God, that you would give clear direction to your people and give that calm assurance that comes with knowing who we are in Christ. And because you are striking covenant with your son and we abide in him, we know that we can ask what we will and it shall be done unto us because we are abiding in him. And you've promised to supply all of our need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We claim every benefit and every blessing provided for us at Calvary. So as we take this cup, we're reminded not only of Christ's suffering, his death, but his resurrection and his soon return. We ask it in Jesus' name. Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And he commanded his disciples to eat the bread. Then he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As oft as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. And he reminded his disciples that there would come a day when they would sit down with him in the kingdom, in heaven, and eat and drink with him there. So drink all of you from the cup. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we worship you. We thank you and we praise you for your sweet, sweet presence here today. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm claiming every benefit and every blessing provided for me in the new covenant. Amen. Pastor Felix is coming right now to officially welcome you. Give him a big hand as he comes. Well, welcome church. Um, what a great service it's been, huh? Awesome. Uh, the, the Lord is here today. Uh, I just want to go ahead and take the time to welcome everyone and really just thank you for being here today. Um, it's just, it's always so great to come here and, and see everyone here and, and worship the Lord. Um, we've been hearing a lot today about knowing the voice of God and kind of reminds me of, of something I've been studying or came across in my studies this week in John chapter 10 about Jesus saying that he is the good shepherd, right? And that his sheep know his voice. He also says that the difference between him, the good, uh, the shepherd and someone who's hired to take care of the sheep is that he who is, uh, takes care of the sheep because they're hired when the wolf comes, they leave, right? They, they don't give their life for the sheep because they're just there for a paycheck. The shepherd, he says that he lays down his life for the sheep. And then he says that his sheep know his voice. So um, praise be to God for that. We are here to listen to the voice of our good shepherd. Um, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, if uh, you are new uh, to, to, to Victory, well, again, welcome. Really glad that you came here. You came to the right place. Um, as you, if you couldn't tell yet, <laughs> um, you've come to the right place. And uh, there is also a, well, a connection card in the seat in front of you, uh, in that back pocket seat. Go ahead and fill that out. Uh, we'd love to, um, well, first of all, you can give that to pastor at the end of service, meet him out in the lobby, say hello to him, him say hello to him. He would love to greet you. Um, and then also he'd like to send you a gift, send you a gift for coming, um, coming to victory. Cause, uh, we're really, we're really glad that you're here today. And at this time, I would like to ask that if this is your first time here, we would love to stand in your honor. Please remain seated. Everyone else, uh, please uh, stand and go ahead, give them a hug, say hello, and just welcome them to the church. Nobody gonna love on you like we love on you here. Okay, and at this time, if we can make our way back to our seats, and if I can have your attention to the big screens, we're going to be playing next the My Victory and the Que Pasa. Um, here are some testimonies and um, stay in, informed on what's going on at the church. A lot of different places for you to get plugged in and serve the church. Thank you, Victor. I'm Tony. And I'm Trish. And we're the Nieveses. And, and this, this is, is my victory. victory. We've been at Victory since June 2020, and we came here when everybody else shut down. Our favorite thing about being at Victory is serving. 
Um, I am the coordinator for girls' ministries, and Tony is the head commander for our Royal Rangers ministry. Royal Rangers and Impact Girls have been a big part of our lives. Like, tithing for us has been key. Um, when I met Trish, I wasn't a believer. I've been tithing consistently since 2016. Um, if you look on paper, our finances don't line up with what our bills are, and they're always covered. When we first started coming here, we weren't really sure about the church, and we took our kids to the kids' ministry with Pastor Sarah and Miss Sherry. Noah, our youngest, has pandas, and he really struggles with social anxiety, and he couldn't go to his class at his old church. We took him here, and he looked at me, he's like, Mommy, you can go to your class, I'm good. And so we knew this was where God wanted us, and this was where God wanted our children. We are, we are the, the Nevises, and, and this, this is, is my victory. victory. That's the beauty of victory. I know. <laughs> Good morning, Victory. I'm Pastor Alba, and this is Get Pastor. Join us tomorrow, Monday, for prayer night. Doors will be open at 7 o'clock. The ladies' conference will be on Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th. For more information, please see Doreen Felder. The men's breakfast will be Saturday the 20th in the Fellowship Hall. That will be a Saturday, so please see Mr. Daryl Felder. It wasn't recording? It wasn't recording. The whole time? Can I throw a shoe? The WWSS are meeting on Sunday, April the 21st at Mike's Pizza. If you want more information, please see Pat Muller. I'm Pastor Alva, and this has been Que Pasa. Now we know what she does when she's mad at Felix. Can I throw a shoe? Just hope it's not one of those big high heel shoes. The message I'm going to share with you today is the most important sermon I have ever preached in my life. And so I'm going to ask you to pray with me that God will give you open ears and an open heart. Would you do that with me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today and we thank you for this lovely congregation. And I thank you, God, for those who are watching online. I thank you, Lord, because you told us that we were not to be stressed out. We were not to be overawed and anxious over the things that we see. In fact, you said, let not your heart be troubled. I will come again. And so I pray, Father, that as we look into your word and as we look around us and see the signs of the times that point like the forefinger of Almighty God the Father to the imminent return of Jesus Christ, that our hearts would be gladdened, that somehow we would be encouraged today and we would be inspired and challenged to win everyone to you that we possibly can and that we would rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and that we would go forward in faith to declare to a lost world, our Redeemer is coming and he shall stand on the earth at the latter day. And in my flesh, as Job said, shall I see God, whom I shall behold with mine own eyes and not another. We ask this in Jesus' name and amen. Turn with me your Bible this morning to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 21 and look at verse 28. Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Nobody on this earth knows the day are the hour of Christ's return. Amen. Jesus said, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. 
But based on what I know about the Word of God and current events, it is my opinion that we are living in the generation that will witness the appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory. Turn with me in your Bible once again to another passage of Scripture that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For many of you, this will be a very familiar passage because it talks about the day of the Lord. While you're turning, let me explain to you that the day of the Lord or the coming of the Lord is in two phases. The first of these is the rapture, which could happen at any moment. That's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Immediately after that, you have what the Bible calls the tribulation. Jesus referred to it as the great tribulation. When Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, the Trinity, he'll be turned loose on the earth. And Satan will enter into the temple that the Antichrist has built for the Jewish people in the middle of the tribulation. And he will enter into that temple in the body of Antichrist and declare that he is God. And the Jews will finally and at long last wake up to the fact that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. That's why in Romans 11 it talks about how all Israel shall be saved. But I wanted you to see this because unless you see it with your own eyes, some of you will not believe it. But Paul talks about the coming of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I want you to follow along with me. He said, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. If you have your pen, I want you to underscore the word you. He is referring to believers. He said, you have no need that I write unto you because you have spiritual awareness. You understand the signs of the times and world conditions. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So this idea of the Lord coming as a thief in the night is the concept that the world has. We know, and I'll show you that in just a few minutes, we know where we're living. We understand the significance of these events that are taking place. For when they shall say, and you need to underscore the word they, who is that? The world. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. That word escape is used several times in scripture in reference to the coming of the Lord. Jesus said, watch ye therefore and pray that you may be found worthy to escape those things that are coming on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. In the book of Hebrews, the second chapter the writer asked the question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And it means to vanish or to disappear. But ye brethren are not in darkness, talking about the church again, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Why? You are all children of light. And children of the day, we are not of the night or of darkness. Take your pen and underscore the word night and darkness, symbolic of sin. But we are children of the light. Who is the light? Christ is the light. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night 
and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now listen, this is very important because there's some people today that are teaching that the church will go through the tribulation. The tribulation period is not persecution. The Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The tribulation is the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Everybody say wrath. wrath. When God pours his wrath out on this earth without mixture. Now watch. For God hath not appointed us, the church, to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we are alive at the coming of the Lord or have died in the faith, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. What I have read in your hearing this morning is a much repeated warning to cold, complacent church members. Amen. To this world, it sounds like folly. It sounds like an idle tale, a fable. But to every born again believer, this is the hope that we have in our hearts. Paul said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But he said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, which means his very own people, zealous of good works. When Jesus was crucified, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. He showed himself alive for 40 days to his disciples. And then he led them as far as Bethany. And there on the Mount of Olives, he lifted his hands and blessed them. And he said, behold, I send the power of the Holy Ghost upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power, clothed and anointed with power from on high. And he ascended to the Father. And angels stood by and they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which ye have seen go into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In other words, he's coming back just like he left. He left with a body. He's coming back with a body. He left with angels. He's coming back with angels. He left in power and great glory, and that's how he's coming back. The Bible says in Hebrews, the word spoken by angels was steadfast. The great apostle Paul said, Christ will return. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump of the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. John said that Christ would return. He said, Beloved, now we the sons of God 
And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The apostle Peter declared that Christ would return. In 2 Peter, he said, there's coming a day when scoffers will ask, where's the promise of his coming? But the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Nevertheless, we according to his promise. Look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The ultimate authority in the universe. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, beginning verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me for in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. Somebody asked me the other day, said, where is heaven? Can you pick it out? Uh, can you point it out on a map of the universe? I said, no, it's not on any map. Is it beyond Pleiades? Is it beyond Orion? Is it beyond the moon 280,000 miles away? Is it beyond the sun 93 million miles from the earth? I don't know exactly how to get there, but I know this in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I'm going to leave this old sin cursed, worn out wicked world and open my eyes and see the face of my Savior in heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's his word. And I believe his word and I believe his promises. Men work so hard to claim uh, uh, a title. I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm a scientist. I'm a research scientist. I'm a biologist. Some people even claim to be, I'm a genius. I know so much. My brain's so big, I gotta have somebody on either side just to keep my head from falling over one way or the other. I'm just, I'm just brilliant. And yet the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And if anybody tells you that the Lord is not coming back, you just mark it down. That's a fool talking to you. Jesus said, I will come again. And he's coming back. You say, well, I don't understand how all this is going to happen, the logistics of it. I don't understand the physics. I don't need to understand that. All I know is he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And he's coming back. Hallelujah. He's coming back. Now, several things have happened in the last three days. Tomorrow is an event that demands that we at least take a look at it through the lens of Scripture. And so I'm going to take the next few minutes to talk to you about the signs of His coming. And the first of these would be signs in the heavens. In Genesis 1 and 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, and let them be for signs and seasons, signs and seasons. It was Jesus who said, in the last days there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. An eclipse is when the moon passes between the earth and the sun. Tomorrow will be a total eclipse sometime around noon until three o'clock. Eventually, the, 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 the whole uh, continental United States will be in darkness because we'll see it. In fact, it's called the Great American Eclipse for a reason. The United States alone will see the eclipse tomorrow. Not any other nation, just the United States of America. Now watch this. This solar eclipse took place seven years ago, 2017. And it moved from the northwest 
down across America into the southeast. This one comes seven years later and it will begin in the, in the northeast and go diagonally across the United States to the southwest. It's called the Jonah Nineveh Eclipse because it will pass over 11 cities named Nineveh. God sent a prophet by the name of Jonah to a city called Nineveh with one message, repent, repent. And I'm so glad that in that 40 days that God gave them that window of opportunity, I'm glad to tell you that Nineveh repented. And I believe that this eclipse is warning America to repent. Oh, but America's not wicked. Don't you know we're responsible for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world? Yes, I know that. Well, don't you know that here in America, we're Christian America and you can worship the Lord according to the dictates of your own heart. Don't you understand that? I do, I do understand it. And I want you to know there's probably nobody you'll ever meet that appreciates the blessing of living in America like I do. I'm grateful for what God has done for this nation. But I want you to hear what the word of the Lord says. It's not about American exceptionalism. It's about the blessing of the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There are historical revisionists who try to tell you that our founding fathers were nothing more than opportunists, slave owners, and they, they were greedy and evil people. I know that we've made mistakes, but we've corrected some of those mistakes to our credit. But when you go back to the early fathers and you look at their lives and you listen to their speeches and you listen to what they wrote and you read it for yourself, you understand that they believed in God. And not only did they believe in God, they believed that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God. Our first president said that we cannot govern a nation without God and the Bible. Many times in Congress, they would stop and get on their knees and seek divine guidance and direction. The first Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, was a man by the name of John Jay. And he said, because America is a Christian nation, we must select Christians as our leaders. But down through the years, America has strayed away from God and America has become a wicked nation. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. You say, is America really wicked? Since 1973, when we legalized abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy, we have murdered nearly 60 million innocent babies in abortion clinics. Is America wicked? We have legalized what God calls an abomination and we call it marriage equality and gay marriage. Is America a wicked place to live? Do you realize that there are people who shake their fist in the face of God Almighty and said, you made me a male, but I'm really a female. You made me a female, but I'll tell you right now, I'm a male inside. And then they get mad at conservatives and say, why won't you accept me for who I say I am? And I say to them, why won't you accept yourself for who God says you are? We have catered to the carnality and the sinfulness that exists in this nation. And we have experienced hell literally vomiting out its filth on this nation of ours. Easter Sunday, our president proclaimed Easter Sunday as Transgender Visibility Sunday. I want you to know Easter Sunday is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it always will be. 
Is America, is America a wicked nation? According to the FBI, America has the highest incidence of violent crime of any nation in this world. You know, just the other day, the Statue of Liberty was struck by lightning. That torch of freedom that she stands and holds to the sky in New York Harbor was hit by a direct lightning strike. And I thought, is God trying to tell us something? X marks the spot where these two eclipses converge. There's a little town and it's called Little Egypt, Illinois. Does anybody know what happened in Egypt? God called his chosen people out of a land of bondage and he took them to the promised land. Could it be that God is saying, get right and get ready church because I'm about to take you out of a society that's become so corrupt and so evil that it's unprecedented in the history of man. It could be that we're living so close to the coming of the Lord that when the trumpet of the Lord sounds that millions will be raised from the dead and those of us who are alive and remain will rise to meet the Lord in midair and say goodbye to this old world. Could happen. Could very well happen. Repentance. The message to America is clear and unequivocal. Repent. The Bible says in Acts 2.38, repent. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. I've studied that for many years. I know what there are some people that teach and they falsely teach that that is some kind of a mode of baptism or a baptismal formula. It's not that at all. What he's saying is when you're baptized... You are to be baptized into Christ so that you take on the very qualities and characteristics of Christ. Not just his power and his authority, not just his glory, but you take on his very nature to be humble and to be meek and to be a servant. So you are baptized into Jesus Christ. And then in Acts chapter three, Peter goes on to say, Repent that your sins may be blotted out and a time of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Did you know the Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Did you know the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I preach to you about five minutes from my heart right now? 14 years, Don and I have been your pastors. 14 years, I've seen a lot of battles that we fought, a lot of trials and tribulations we've been through together. We have walked arm in arm through some storms. But one of the things that alarms me, and I think this is more alarming than any betrayal, any attack that I have ever experienced in these 14 years, and that is that I have watched Christians become nominal Christians. I have watched some of you come into the house on Sunday morning and instead of participating, instead of entering in, you don't worship. You don't lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You don't even sing the songs anymore. But you sit there and you just soak and you sour and you're sullen and you don't engage. You come on a Sunday morning, but we can't find you on a Wednesday night. We can't find you in a prayer meeting. Your life no longer speaks of a glorious transformation in Christ, but you're so much like the world that you feel more comfortable at a ball game and more comfortable out there in this world than when you come to the house of God. It is time for God to get hold of your heart one more time and wash your eyes with tears and cause you to get in this altar and seek God until you are restored. For 14 years, I have looked for you in this altar. 
For 14 years, you've never prayed a prayer in this altar. For 14 years, you've never been to a miracle Sunday night service, and yet you'll proudly boast, I'm a member of victory. I've been in victory a long time. I'm not interested in you being in victory, tabernacle. I'm interested in you having the victory through Jesus Christ. And if you're not very careful with your religion, with your religion, you're going to go straight to hell, miss the rapture, and go to hell and, and, and lose everything simply because you have a form of godliness, but you have rejected the power of God. What are you talking about? The power of God to transform you, to change you, so that you become a new creation so that you're not who you used to be, so that you don't act like you used to act. You don't talk like you used to talk. Some of you are still cursing and using the name of the Lord in vain. Some of you are still drinking and smoking and, and doing drugs occasionally, fornicating, committing adultery, but you said, I'm okay because I'm going to church. You're not okay. You could miss the rapture sitting in this church building and listening to my preaching. Some of you that are watching online, you at one time had a vibrant living faith. You walk with the Lord, but you've grown cold and indifferent. You haven't darkened the door of God's house in years since COVID. And God is calling you to get on your knees and to repent and to call on God right now. You know what's going to send a lot of people to hell? A religious spirit. If you can't be corrected, if you're not willing to be accountable, you're not a Christian. Let me say it again. If you're not willing to be corrected, if you can't be accountable for what you do, if you won't be responsible for your own actions, you want to throw that off on somebody else. Well, you know, if I had a better preacher, if I had a better church, I'd do better. Let me ask you something. Did you ever read about Judas? Did Judas have a good pastor? Did, was Judas surrounded by good people who love God? I mean, how much closer can you get than to be right side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet he was the son of perdition. He was lost. Why? Because he had a spirit of religion, but he never did know Christ. Oh, God, help me to preach it this morning. Whether you say amen or ouch, I'm going to tell you the truth today. I might not be here next week to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell it to you right now. There was a, there was a, a collision cargo ship. You saw it. Everybody saw it. I was watching Fox News. They played that thing a hundred times in an hour. All the time they were talking up in the split screen, you can see that cargo ship hit the center pillar, support pillar of the uh, bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? All right, let me show you what I think it's got to do with it. I think it was spiritually significant that that bridge went down because it is the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Francis Scott Key sat right there in that harbor on board a ship and wrote the national anthem. He watched a battle raging that would decide the fate of America. And the following... The following is the last stanza of the national anthem, and I'll guarantee you've never heard it. Are you ready? Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved home and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace. May the heaven-rescued land praise the God that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of of the brave. America, it's time to repent. America, 
it's time to get back to God. And I pray that a Holy Ghost revival will begin to burn. It'll burn out of control. It will sweep across this nation like a wind-driven prairie wildfire going from city to city. Every town, every hamlet, every village, and every community will experience the fire of God. I pray that God will wake us up out of our slumber, out of our spiritual lethargy, and we'll get back to where we need to be with God. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So we have signs in the heavens. We have signs in the earth. Two days ago, on the 4.8 Richter scale, an earthquake hit New York City. I was watching live coverage of the United Nations, which was in session, and the building began to shake. You should have seen the expression on the faces of these diplomats. Shock. What is this? It's unexpected. We have no warning. Most of all, they were saying there's nothing we can do to change the circumstances. It is what it is. And if that building had fallen on their heads, there would have been one thing they could have done about it. That's the same expression that's going to be on the face of every person who knows about the Word of God when Jesus comes back. Oh, I didn't know it was going to happen so soon. Why didn't somebody warn me? I'm warning you. I'm telling you. Get right. Jesus is coming back. Seems that now almost see all oh, the sainted dead rising for that jubilee that is just ahead in the twinkling of an eye. Change with them will be all oh, the living saints to fly to that jubilee. Oh, what singing, what a day of shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we see our blessed Savior in the skies. Jesus said in Matthew 24, one of the end time signs is there would be earthquakes in diverse places. Earthquakes. The same day an earthquake hit New York, New Jersey, Taiwan experienced an earthquake. Diverse places, different kinds of places. In ancient times, when a Jewish man wanted to wear, marry a Jewish woman, I told you earlier, he would prepare a cup of wine, place it in front of her, and she would either drink it and accept the proposal or reject it. But there were other practices. And this comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25. You see, the first time I got married, I was a bridegroom. The next time I'm going to be a bride because I'm in the bride of Christ. The bridegroom, after his bride accepted the proposal, would go to build them a place to live. It wasn't uncommon for him to be gone two years. But he would tell her, I'm coming back. And then I'm going to take you to the place I've prepared for you. Jesus weaves into that narrative 10 virgins. They were adorned and ready to go into the wedding. They had their lamps, but only five of them had oil. It was a common practice for the party of the bridegroom to have a designated person who on the day of the wedding would go before the bridegroom's party and he would shout, Behold! The bridegroom is coming. Behold, 
the bridegroom is coming. See, the reason they did that because it could be at midnight. It could be in the middle of the night. It could be early in the morning. And maybe that bride's sleeping. Maybe she hasn't adorned herself, prepared herself. But the friend of the bridegroom would shout, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Bride, you better get up. You better wipe the sleep out of your eyes. You better get up and get ready. Those 10 virgins were supposed to be ready as well. But five of them had oil in their lamps and five didn't. Five wise, five foolish. But when the wedding began, the Bible said the door was shut. And the five foolish virgins that had lamps with no oil were left outside. If this is not a picture of the church today, I don't know what it is. 60% of churches, in my opinion, are operating in the spirit of Cain. Oh, they know about religious worship. They just don't understand the heart of it. See, Cain showed up to worship. He knew the place. It was east of Eden. He knew what he was supposed to do, but pride took over. And all the sins and vices of men and fallen angels have their root in the proud atheism of self. And he said, I know it's supposed to be a blood offering, but I grew these beautiful vegetables and look how, what I did. I did all this without miracle growing. I want God to see what I can do all by myself. And he laid it down at the altar and God rejected his offering and accepted Abel's because Abel had the prescribed offering. It was a blood sacrifice. Cain never stopped being religious, but in a religious rage, he killed his brother Cain because he couldn't kill God. The church is divided today. You have people that claim, oh, I'm religious. I know God, but I hate these holy rollers. I hate these tongue talkers. I hate these people who say you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and receive power for service. I hate those people to get all emotional. I hate those people that have a religion that takes over their life. I got a life. I hate those people that think they need to go to church three or four times a week. I can't stand them. And so you got five foolish virgins and you got five wise virgins. Virgins, you got people in this house that have a lamp and no oil. Your name is on the church rolls. You have been known to be a member of this church for many years, but there is no oil in your lamp. And when the bridegroom finally shows up and takes the bride into the place to have the wedding, you are going to be left on the outside because he will shut the door. Somebody said, boy, you sure are preaching hard. Probably not as hard as you need it. I'm just telling you, nothing in this world breaks my heart like thinking there'd be people that sit under my preaching and be a part of this great church for years and years and then be left behind. You say, I really think that you're just over-dramatizing. Really? What was last Sunday? What? Last Sunday was Easter. Do you think the people that sat next to you last Sunday thought that we only opened on Easter Sunday? Or did they have just enough religion to get them here once a year? Just enough to get them. Somebody said, oh, I know when the Lord comes, he's going to raise us up. He's gonna, he can't even raise some people up out of the sheets to get to bed. God can't get your attention to come to a prayer meeting. How's he going to get your attention to call you out of this world? You say, I'm going to get mad at you. Well, you'll have to get in line. I'm sorry. Take a number. And I'm not going to be the preacher you look for in hell that lied to you either. 
And it's time for us to get thoroughly right with God and stop playing church. Now, I know some people haven't been to church since COVID. But if I run to them somewhere, praise the Lord, Pastor Sam, I don't, I don't, I'm so close to God, I can't even say sauerkraut without speaking in tongues. I'm, I'm telling you, oh, I'm about to get translated here. And I'm thinking, yeah, but what about us? You left us. You abandoned us. You hadn't given a dime. You don't come to church anymore. But, oh, I'm so glad that you're doing so good. I don't work that way. Somebody leave their wife, abandon their church. I'm doing great. I'm closer to God than I've ever been. Oh, is that how? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have stayed with my wife for 52 years because I don't, I don't feel that close all the time. So I guess I just abandon my wife and abandon the church, turn my back on everything, and then I'll be closer to God than I've ever been. I don't believe that for a minute in my life. I wouldn't believe that. You think I'm so dumb I fell off a turnip truck last night or something? I don't believe that mess. You've got to get real. I'm tired of fake Christians. I'm tired of people pretending to be something they're not. It's time for us to get right, get real, and go home. Jesus is coming back. Ooh, you sure mean today. I'm holding back. I'm holding back. You know why I'm telling you this? Because I love you. Somebody won't love, don't tell you the truth, won't love you. And I love you that much. Christ is coming. Are you ready? Stand with me. All I'm going to say to you this morning is this. If you want to be ready when Jesus comes, get out of your seat and come stand in here. I want to pray with you. Come on. What if this would be the day when Jesus comes? Oh, the day that we've been waiting for so long. We have so little time to get our lost world one. If this would be the day when Jesus comes, Christ is coming. Hallelujah. Sing it with me, everybody. Christ is coming. best to tell people what you told me and I've delivered my soul today God please reach down your hand touch us today the song Melody sang earlier when she said there are times when my heart is stirred but never truly changed you deserve a fiery love that won't ignore your sacrifice. Father, please get hold of every heart. My nightmare is that after I've preached for 14 years to people, that some of those same people would miss the rapture. Some of the same people that have been to church week after week, month after month, year after year, that have never truly been changed. I can't save anybody. I know that. But Lord, you can and you will. And so I'm asking you right now 
to save every lost soul and restore every backslider. We're not ready because we feel good all the time or because of our strength of character. Because you said there's none good, no, not one, and we realize that. Only you are good. But we'll make it by the shed blood of Christ and the grace of God. But we won't make it, Lord, if we're distracted. We won't make it if we take our eyes off the goal. We won't make it if we forget who we are and what we're called to do. You said, watch ye therefore and be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Already there are religious people and ministers who mock anybody that preached a sermon on the coming of the Lord as trying to be sensational. And they say, well, everything's going to be the same. And if we watch the news, they laugh about it. It might be dark for a little while, but then the light's going to shine again and it's no big deal. It's just a little speed bump, nothing to be alarmed about, nothing to be concerned about. An earthquake hits a city and the prognosticators come out and say, don't panic, it's okay. Don't worry about aftershocks, don't worry about anything. Life continues. But some morning, some noontime, some midnight hour, everything's going to change. And we're going home. Please, please, Father, don't let anybody in this church be left behind. Don't let one person, not one, I know, and I love them dearly, but I know that there are people that not once have ever stayed for an altar call. Never. All the years I've known them. They'll stay through the sermon, and when everybody hits bowed and every eye's closed, they hit the door. There are people that come 20, 30 minutes late just so that they don't really have to encounter anybody because for them, for whatever reason, it's become a habit, but it hasn't become a life-changing experience. And if that's the case, then I've failed miserably. I want everybody to be ready when the trumpet of the Lord sounds. Would you reach over and put your hand on somebody's shoulder, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Now, if you mean this prayer from your heart, there's no reason why you can't walk out of that door and say, let come what may. I'm washed in the blood. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ, and I'm ready. And like John, I can pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. Don't go through the motions. Just don't say the words. But from your heart, I want you to pray. Are you ready? Pray this prayer with me like this. Say, dear Heavenly Father, forgive me. For all my sins cleanse me in the blood of Jesus make me as pure and holy as the blood can make me and what the blood is cleansed let the anointing of the Holy Ghost empower Lord have your way in my life by your help and grace I will live for you so that when you come or call, I will be ready. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please lift your hands and begin to thank him and praise him. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I praise you. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the blood that was shed on Calvary for my sins. I thank you for the grace that lifted me up from where I was. Thank you, Lord, because I belong to you. You're my father. That's who you are, but I'm loved by you, and that's who I am. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. How many of you have somebody that you love and they're not ready for the coming of the Lord? Look at this. Almost everybody, almost everybody. Once again, I want you to, if you can, take somebody's hand in yours. We're going to pray for them. Father, you've said to us that people would come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And we believe it. Many of those people, no doubt, are our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, our loved ones, maybe even a husband or a wife. There are people that talk about, oh, I got church hurt. I got church hurt. They never get mall hurt. They never get shopping center hurt. They never get dining room hurt. They just get church hurt. God, would you please open their eyes to see that the one who saved them deserves their love and their allegiance. That it's not about what somebody else did or said, but it's about what you did for us and how you saved us. Lord, whatever obstacle is in the way for those people to be saved, Lord, we ask that you'd remove it now in the name of Jesus. And then give to us a burden for our families. Help us to get up under that burden and to love them and to pray for them and to talk to them and to witness to them and encourage them. And Lord, we just claim them right now in the name of Jesus because time is short. We just simply ask that whatever it takes, oh God, that, that somehow they would be directed to the cross. And this very moment, Lord God, right wherever they are in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we claim every one of them. Now God, help us to live out who we say we are. Help us not to compromise. Help us not to live a double life. Help us, oh God, to live out our faith every day so that we can point somebody to Jesus. Not so we can brag about our own righteousness because we know it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. But people can see that we've been changed and we can point them to a savior who can change them. We ask it in Jesus' holy name, amen. One more time, if you know you're ready for the coming of the Lord, give God praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, where's Jim? Jim Cohen? Jim's got some people to help him as well. I don't want you to ever think that when we do the benediction, and I like to greet visitors, that somehow that we don't minister here. We've got ministers down here. If you want to uh, prayer, won't have, have hands laid on you. You feel free to just stay here and let us know we're going to pray for you. We don't have to turn the lights off. We don't have to be out any certain time. And uh, we'll pray for you and minister to you, okay? One more time, I want you to turn to somebody and say, if Jesus comes, I'm ready to go. There you go. There you go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe.